Let's open with a uh, prayer. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this time we can come to study uh, your word and to learn. Uh, Father, a very important thing that needs to, uh, to be in each of our lives, and that is uh, true fellowship, uh, great relationships, Lord. And so as we uh, look at your word today, and we come to this uh, command number six, uh, Father, as we talk about being rec re uh, reconciled to one another, open our hearts, our minds, to be receptive to your word and to make application to our own lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> number six, being reconciled. And in the last week we talked about, we're going to find out the most through almost all of the commands that God has given us, the uh, <coughs> undergirding foundation is love. Because that is what, that is the very foundation of our relationship with God, is love. God so loved the world. He started it and, uh, and passed it on to us and we're to pass it out to everyone else. So love, living our victory Everywhere, every time, to everyone. And uh, we need to live out the love that God has given us. We need to live that out in our lives to everyone else. I want to begin by reading the, the passage of Scripture. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. And, uh, Jesus was talking to disciples and he says therefore what is that therefore 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 <laughs> anyone know it means it comes after something significant that was just said exactly exactly he was talking about in just the previous verses about anger right <clears throat> Honoring God's law and about anger, about loving, uh, loving each other, loving one another, uh, and there in verse twenty-one, it says, "You have heard and said, of old you shall not murder." But then he talks about anger in our hearts against one another, hating one another. That's that's the same as murder. Uh, and then he says, therefore, what, what is it you need? He says, therefore, now if you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar and go your way. First, he says, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. But, uh, now, I, I would go so far as to say that not only if, uh, if your brother has something against you, but if you have something against your brother, if you know that you've offended someone, you need to make that right. You need to be reconciled. Uh, with that individual. And also, I just want to point out something here. It says that uh, <coughs> if you bring your gift to the altar, he's not necessarily talking about if you, like you bring your tithes and, and, and offerings to the church. He's talking about your gift, your gift of worship, your gift of, of, of praise to God. When you come to worship the Lord, when you come to bring your gift, your gift of praise, your gift of worship, and, and sacrifice to the Lord. Listen, if there's something between you and someone else that's not right, he says, leave your gift there. Go make it right. And then come back and give your gift. Then come back. Don't just go, okay, I made it right, now I'm good, and I go my way. No, no, you still come back and give your gift. Uh, we can't get out of rendering unto God what is God. Just because we're upset with somebody else. 
when you I, make your I life. Yes. Question. I thought about somebody in my last church in Brookings. She wouldn't be reconciled. Oh, and yeah. I tried over and over, and it created such a bad feeling in me in that church because she wouldn't be like over and over. Okay, we're going to address that uh, today. Uh, one of the things about what happens if I try to reconcile with another person and they, they refuse. Yes? Does this apply to communion too, for example, because you say, you know, sin should be gotten rid of before you take communion? Exactly. Uh, it, it does to the point that here I am about to take communion and I realize that there is a rift between me and someone else. I need, at that point, I need to, to ask God to forgive me what's in my heart and to make that commitment that I'm going to go and make it right for that individual. Then I can take communion. But I need to follow through on that commitment. Because remember what uh, Paul also said? Don't partake in the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Make it a... a, a, a commitment to the Lord and then not following through, you've taken communion in an unworthy manner. Does that make sense? You understand that? Okay. Now, uh, to be reconciled, what is it to be to be reconciled? It, it is to restore a broken relationship and to return to a former state of harmony. Former state of harmony. Remember when, when God created uh, the Garden of Eden? It was a perfect paradise, wasn't it? And every day, God would come down and, and he would take walks with Adam and Eve through the Garden of Eden, and they had that perfect fellowship. They had a, a very close relationship with one another. They were in harmony with one another. However, when they sinned, that relationship was broken. So they were no longer in, in fellowship or in harmony with God. Now, that's why Jesus came down and died on the cross. He paid the penalty for mankind's sin, thus providing the way for man to be reconciled with God, to, to restore that broken relationship to to return us to that former state of harmony with God now as we learn in our lesson uh, for today uh, well, let me do something here real quick I like this ah. that way I can keep stuff right there uh, as we learn in, in our lesson today, we, when we have been offended by another person, the issue is not so much as who was right and who was wrong. Whose fault is it? In order for reconciliation to take place, each person has to focus on his response to the other person. I've got to, I've got to focus on what my response is to, to them. And it's extremely important for us that we have the, a, a Christ-like response. I like what Paul, the Apostle Paul said. He said, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. What was the mind that was in Christ Jesus? What, what was Christ really like? If we want to be like Christ, what do we need to be like? Well, Jesus was, was God. And God is a God of grace. God is a God of mercy. God is a God of forgiving, a God of love. That's the mindset that we have to have in our own lives. We, we must have a Christ-like response also to that individual. Reconciliation will only happen when we take full responsibility of our own faults. 
What is it that I might have done to cause that situation to go awry? What is my part in this whole thing? What do I need to do? Which brings us now to the character quality that we find is associated with being reconciled. It's called responsibility. Responsibility. What is the opposite of responsibility? Unreliability. Unreliability. Hey, I'm either responsible and reliable or I'm irresponsible and unreliable. Responsibility versus unreliability. Responsibility, as we've learned, is knowing and doing what God and others are expecting of me. Responsibility is not just doing what you said you would do, but doing what you know you should do. Responsibility is doing what you ought to do even when you don't want to do it. Because sometimes uh, we don't want to do what we know we ought to do. The concept of responsibility, I believe, is best described in uh, the biblical word duty. D-U-T-Y. <laughs> Duty. Uh, that's translated from the Greek word. See, I've got to spell this right. O P H E I L O. Ophilo. Ophilo. And, and in the New Testament, there are several words that, that it, uh, it relates to that it is. Uh, several words, it, it's translated in many ways in the New Testament. These, these words, such as ought, do, need. Let's see, I'll write those down. Ought, do, owe, and bound. Huh? Owe, and bound. Oh, did I put oh. that in there for you? Yes, it's all there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must have done my homework, huh? <laughs> owe and, 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 and bound. Confidence that indicate a requirement. Exactly. A responsibility, a <clears throat> duty. In other words, uh, Romans 15 11. When we then who are strong ought, ophilo, ought to bear with the scruples of the weak, or with the weaknesses of the weak. 1 Corinthians 7 3. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due, ophilo, do her. Romans 13 8. O, ophilo, no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. And then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, But we are bound, O Philo, we are bound, to give thanks to God always for you, brethren. Paul says, I have a responsibility to do that. That's my duty. My duty is to pray for you. Well, what does the Bible say? Pray for one another. My duty is to, to not owe anyone anything except a debt of what? What does the Bible say? Love one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. My duty is that I ought to bear with the, the Bible says scruples, I think that's the shortcomings, of others. Why are you looking at the back row when you say that? If, <laughs> you know, if, if, if God is focusing your eyes on my eyes, then he must be trying to tell you something. Uh-oh. Uh, that means that I have a duty, I have a responsibility to, uh, 
you know, Galatians 6.1 says, If a brother is caught in sin, who, he who is, is uh, uh, righteous or he who is, is right with God needs to go to that brother and restore such a one. And so we need to bear with the weaknesses of, of others. Uh, you know, according to 1 Corinthians 7, 3, I have a duty, a responsibility, a duty to, to render affection to my wife. So, you know, that's the reason when I open the car door for her, I let her get all the way in before I close the door. <laughs> Or all the way out. Or all the way out. Yeah. yeah. So, so what are some duties that are my responsibilities? Well, number one is this: paying a debt of love. Paying a debt of love. Isn't that what uh, Romans thirteen three uh, eight says? Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Number two, supporting faithful ministers. We find that in Romans 15, 27. Truly, it has pleased them, and they are their debtors. For if the nations had been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in fleshly things. He's talking about pastors, bishops, ministers of the gospel. We have a responsibility. It's a duty. The third thing is this. Protecting weaker believers. Protecting weaker believers. Romans 15.1 Then we who are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. In other words, if, if I am, if I'm helping someone who is weaker, who are, uh, who may be sick or something like that, I'm not doing it so that I can look good. I'm doing it because that's what my responsibility, my duty is to do that, and I'm doing it out of what? Love. It's all, it, it, it all has to be predicated on the love that I have in my heart. Number four. What does number four say? Making what kind of decisions? Anybody guess what that is? Good decisions. Good. No. Sam Roberts. No. No. Righteous. No. Righteous. Uh, accurate. No. Biblical. No. Decent. No. Holy cow, what is it? <laughs> Making marriage decisions. First Corinthians 7. 36. Marriage? Marriage. We have a responsibility in our marriages to make good marriage decisions. 1 Corinthians 7, 36. But if anyone thinks it behaving himself indecently, what's it? Did I get that right? Yes. Yeah. Thinks it behaving himself indecently towards his virgin, his wife, if she is past her prime, and so it ought to be. Let him do what he will. He does not sin. Let them marry. In other words, make right marriage decisions. If I'm involved in a relationship with someone I'm not married to, and uh, I'm just having a hard time keeping my hands off of her, hey, it's better that I marry her. Especially if she's past her prime. Yeah. Especially if she's past her prime. Most of us understand. I, I, I don't, you know. I, let's go to number five. <laughs> Giving love in marriage. Ephesians 5.28 So men ought to love their wives. Men ought, ophelo, ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. <clears throat> You're joking me, I... I'll say this to someone who's really, who I notice, some guy that's really stuck on themselves. You, you, you know guys like that. A few. It's all about me. It's all, I, you know, it's all about me. I'm good at this. I'm, and, and I said, boy, you really love yourself. Yeah. yeah. But, but I will say it that way. No. When you start that, I'll tell says, man, you must really love your wife. <laughs> and, even though she, he's complaining about her and all this stuff. 
I do this better than... I said, you must really love your wife. Why? Because the Bible says that you are to love your wife as you love yourself. <laughs> I love the reaction I get. Well, yeah. <coughs> How love? many times have you been hit? Because <laughs> I duck pretty good. Pastor, what was number five? I'm sorry. Giving love in marriage. Yeah, I am looking at the back row. Hey, I'm doing what I can. <laughs> Good deal. <coughs> Number six. Six. Be thankful for believers. We are bound, Othello, to thank God always for you, for brothers, my brothers, as it is right because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of each one of you abounds toward one another. So we need to be thankful for for one another. Number seven, suffering for believers. 1 John 3.16, I like that, it goes with John 3.16, for God so loved the world. It says, by this we know, we have known the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. You notice how John 3.16 and 1 John 3.16 God so loved the world that he did what? He laid down his life for us. And, and, and 1 John 3.16 says that because he laid down his life for us. We ought also to lay down our lives for one another. And then uh, in uh, number eight, being in submission. Being in submission. 1 Corinthians 11.10 For this reason, the woman ought, a fellow, to have authority on her head because of the angels. In other words, we, we all live under authority. And what is our authority? In, in, uh, we live under the authority of the government. We live under the authority, if I'm in school, of my principal and, and the teachers, right? If I am at work, I live under the authority of what? My employer, my manager. In home, if I am a, chi if I am a child, I live under the authority of my parents. The wife is under the authority of the husband. And the husband is under the authority of God. That, that whole line of authority really comes down. And so that's, that's what it's telling us there. We all have authority over us. No one is exempt from, from having authority over them. Uh, number nine, caring for children. 2 Corinthians 12, 14. Behold, a third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not burden you, for I do not seek your things, but you. For the children ought, Othello, not to lay up treasure for their parents, but the parents for the children. As, as we're raising our children, we're responsible for them. It's our duty to take care of our children. And to raise them up. How? Well, to make sure that they physically are taken care of, that they're socially, mentally taken care of, but that they're spiritually taken care of as well. Obviously, train up a child in the way he should go. In Deuteronomy, God gave a, a very strict command that he is to teach these things to your children, whether you're sitting at the table, whether you're uh, taking a walk with them, or anything. I found out uh, quite, a, quite a long time ago, was, was our daughter was much younger then, good time to really share with her is when you're out walking together. You, you, you don't have to have this, this sit down face to face, and I'm going to tell you this now. You can just bring things up. Maybe, maybe she's made a bad decision or a, a, a bad choice on something, and, and you're walking along and you said, you know, the way you handle that situation, would, would, would there have been a better way of handling that? You don't think it. But we are to, to uh, take care of our children in all areas of, of their lives. Uh, number 10, walking in Christ's love. He who says he abides in him ought himself 
also to walk even as he walked. We have a duty, a responsibility to walk as Jesus walked. Let this mind be in you which is in Christ Jesus. Paul says, as I imitate me as I imitate the Lord. We're to imitate Christ in his life. <clears throat> And then 1 uh, John chapter 4, verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought, we have a duty, a responsibility, we ought also to love one another. It's our responsibility. <clears throat> and then, let's see, number 11. Providing hospitality. Providing hospitality. Hostility. Hostility, yeah. <laughs> Providing hostility in Fred's case. <laughs> Providing hospitality. Well, you won't have very many visitors. Yeah, third, third John, chapter one, verse five. Don't get that. Third John, one. chapter one, verse five. Third John. Exactly. How many third Johns do you have? I, I, I went into this uh, Bible program that I have on my computer, and I kept type, typing in third John five. And it wouldn't let me do it. Third John 5. And it wouldn't let me do it. Third John 1, 5. And it popped it right up. And I said, you don't even know that there's no other chapters in John? It is. You can win an argument with a human, but never with the computer. Never with a computer. I hate it. We all know that. Exactly. It says, Beloved, you do faithfully whatever, uh, whatever you work for the brothers and for strangers who in love bore witness of you before the church, whom you will do well to send forward worthily of God, because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the nations. Therefore we ought to entertain such, or have show hospitality to such, so that we might be co-workers of the truth. When missionaries come to our area, we need to show good hospitality towards them. When brothers or sisters are passing through and they need a place to stay, they need a place, they need you know food to eat or, or transportation, but we need to show hospitality toward them. So, how does my debt require responsibility? Did you know our country right now? United States of America has a tremendous national debt. In fact, as of this month, the U.S. national debt is $23,305,000,000. Or no, it's $23 trillion. I was thinking for the whole time, I've always seen trillion. Trillion. Twenty-three trillion dollars. Twenty-three trillion three hundred five million two hundred ninety-seven. No, wait a minute. <laughs> it's trillion, it's trillion billion. Yeah. yeah. Twenty-three trillion. It's over twenty-three. Yeah. It's there it's twenty-three go. over twenty-three trillion and growing and growing. As a matter of fact, they anticipate by the year. Uh, I can't remember what year it is off in the future, 2025 or something like that, it's going to increase by about 180%. Now, I thought it was decreasing. Well, that's what you get for thinking. Or listening to the politicians. Or listening to the politicians. <laughs> what you were talking about, Willis. <laughs> yeah, our, 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 it's growing. Well, listen, how in the world can you have someone that, that, will, that will come in and promise to give free medical care to everybody and free food stamps to everybody and all these free programs, where do you think the money's going to come from? You and me. Exactly. That's the national debt that keeps going up and up and up and up. Elizabeth said there was unlimited money. Yeah, it's unlimited money. That's right. We, all we've done, we just go out and print some more. Just print, yeah. yeah. Well, here's the thing. And people buy it. Here's the thing. Even though, and we have this tremendous debt, but in the same way, 
Listen, in the same way that we as citizens of the United States share in the debt of our country, every believer shares a debt of love to every other believer. Doing the math, that means if we were to take our national debt and put it on the shoulders of every American, we're each in debt $70 million. $70 million? Oh, what it equates to, roughly. I think I'll follow chapter 11 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out. 70, 70 so anyway, million. that's, I, I, the only reason I bought the national debt up to show you, even though we are, we have to pay our fair share, and even though that we, uh, uh, share in that debt load, we also share in the debt load of love toward one another. That's what Paul states in Romans chapter 13, verse 8. He says this, Oh, Ophelo, oh, no one, anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. God's love for us was so great that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. And Jesus loved us so much that he willingly went to the cross and suffered and died for us. He didn't have to. In fact, he said that. He says, no one forces me to go to the cross. I go on my own free will. I have the power to take it up or... Lay it down. But I choose to go to the cross. I choose to give my life for you. So, we owe an immeasurable debt of love to Christ. And the question is, how can we even begin to pay that debt? How can I begin to pay that debt of love that I owe to Christ? Well, Jesus gives us the answer to that question. As he explains that what we do to benefit others actually benefits him. And he says in Matthew chapter 25, verse 40, And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brother, you did it to me. We, we should have that same sense of indebtedness in our, in our employment responsibilities as well, because that's what Paul said in, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 through 24. And whatever you do, do it heartedly as to the Lord, not to men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a duty and a responsibility to love one another, to do our best for one another, but also as employees we have that responsibility to do our best for our employer. That helps us, I think, understand more the meaning of what Jesus was telling his disciples in Luke chapter 17. In Luke 17, verses 7 through 11, he talked about faith and duty. He talked about the, uh, uh, the, the, the steward there. He says, And which of you, listen, which of you, having a servant plowing and tending sheep, in other words, which of you having an employee, will say to him when he has come in from the field, well, come on over, come, in, come at once and sit down and eat. He says, but will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk and afterwards you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant? Because he did the things that were commanded of him? Does he thank the service because he did what was required of him? He did his duty? He just did what his responsibility was? Does he thank him for that? Jesus says, I think not. 
So likewise you, when you have done those things which you are commanded, which you have a responsibility to, which you have a duty to, say, we're unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty. A fellow. Use the word fellow again. What was our duty to do? We have done what was our responsibility. Now, it's always nice as an employer if you thank your employees for the job they did, whether it's their responsibility or not. Because I found this out, at, at having served in uh, various positions in, in different companies, uh, and, and being taught this from the owner president of one of the companies, one of the first things he taught me when, when I first became went into management, he said, Rick, you take care of your employees, they will take care of you. Right. And so, yeah, we do give them thanks, we do give them accolades and, and praises and stuff, but, but here's the thing. They're just doing their duty. That's what they signed up to do. You know, I, it's like, I like to go around when I see a veteran, even though I'm a veteran myself, I like to thank the veterans, other veterans, for their service to our country. <laughs> and, and when they turn around and say, well, thank you for your service, I just well, thank you for your support. <laughs> I'm thankful for their support. I was only doing what my duty was. That's what I signed up for. And uh, when, when you sign up, you get to, to go and complain about what you're having to do is not good. It's not right. It's not biblical. We sign up. We do what is our duty. And that's what Jesus was saying there about that servant. They were doing what their duty was. How are we personally accountable for our responsibility? How are we personally accountable for our responsibility? Because a, a very Im important aspect the responsibility is being personally accountable for several things. Being accountable. Do I have those in the notes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, let me write these on there. I know what they are, but I better make sure I spell them right because somebody owes me on Right? <laughs> Why did you look at me? Because you're my proofreader. Well, if I'm your proofreader, that's her authority over you. you. <laughs> Our responsibility. We're accountable for what? Our thoughts? We are to be accountable for our words. We're to be accountable for our attitudes. And for our actions. Accountable for our, our thoughts, our words, our attitudes, and our actions. That's about everything. That's just about everything. <laughs> <coughs> and, and all of these... Thoughts, words, and all of those things are to be consistent with the commands of Christ. Every command that Christ gives us, these are to be consistent with those commands. How are my thoughts? What about my words? What about my attitudes? What about my actions? Because here's the thing. In the final judgment, they're going to be exposed. They're going to be evaluated on the basis, what do you think they're going to be evaluated on the basis of what? Anybody care to guess? <laughs> they're going to be evaluated on the basis of genuine love. In 1 John, 1 John, John, John. Chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. This is what 
the Apostle John wrote. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know we are in him. He who says he abides in him, here's that word of fellow again, ought himself also to walk as he walked. He who says I love him, he who says that, that uh, uh, and does not keep his commandments. If I say I know the Lord, but I don't keep his commandments, I'm lying. I really don't know it. And then that word know doesn't just mean a, a mental knowledge of Christ. It means that I don't have that abiding relationship with him. It's the same word know that's in Matthew when, when uh, uh, the Bible said Joseph did not know his wife Mary until after the birth of Jesus. He didn't have an intimate relationship with her. And that's the same word that Jesus used when he looked at, at those who came up and said, Hey, Lord, didn't we do all this good stuff for you? Man, we were great. Didn't we do all this stuff? And Jesus said, Hey, depart from me, you workers of inequity, for I never knew you. We never had this abiding, intimate relationship with one another. And if we say that we know God, that we know Christ, and we don't live by His commands, and we don't, we're not obedient to His commands, then we're liars. And that's tough sometimes. And it's tough sometimes to have to, have to sit across from someone and they're, demand, they're saying how much they know the Lord and how much they're Christian and all, but, but they're living in open, flavored sin, and to have to look at them and say, you know what, you're a liar. You are a liar. And that's not coming from me, that's coming from God Himself, because here's what the Bible says. And, and to read that scripture to them. You say you know Christ, yet look, what you're, look, look at this life you're living. You're living in sexual immorality, but you say you know Christ, you're a liar. And the truth's not in you. You, you say that you know Christ, and yet you refuse to have fellowship with other believers. You don't really know Christ, you're a liar. The truth's not in you. You, you fail to, to obey the commands of Christ. You're a liar, the truth's not in you. That's a pretty hard thing to take, isn't it? Are you trying to offend me? <laughs> Is it working? Is that? We reconciled. Well, I, I, maybe, maybe you abiding by the same uh, by the same counsel that I got when I first went into ministry, and he told me, he says, Rick, in order to be a pastor, you got to have the height of a rhinoceros, but the heart of a dove. That's, yeah, it is. Eye of a rhinoceros, but the heart of a dove. Uh, so how can how how are we to be personally accountable for our responsibilities, for our thoughts, uh, our words, our attitudes, our actions? Number one, we will be for, uh, personally accountable for our thoughts. Second Corinthians, chapter ten. Verse 5. The Bible tells us that we have to be casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into <laughs> captivity every thought. Bringing that into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Yes? How do we do that? I mean... It's easier to say, okay, I won't say anything bad or I won't do anything bad, but to say I won't think anything bad. I mean, that's... Yeah, when you realize, and this is something that I that I have to deal with too, because, you know, every once in a while, you get these thoughts. Satan is always out there shooting these fiery darts at us. The Bible says he's shooting fiery darts at us. Uh, you know, and, and that's what Peter said, to be 
uh, be very careful. Be on your alert. Be ready because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he might devour, seeking whom he might intimidate, whom he might destroy. He wants to destroy your witness, your testimony, your ability to, to be effective for advancing the kingdom of God. And so when, when he's shooting these thoughts at you and you start getting these thoughts into your mind, the best way to handle that is, is take it into captivity. Stop. And, 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 you know, memorize Scripture and start quoting Scripture. Every time Jesus was tempted by the devil, what did he do? It is written. You know, and, and sometimes when I start getting thoughts in my mind, I start saying, hey, you know, the Bible says, uh, set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. Whatever is, is lovely, peaceable, I'm good uh, you know, those things, think on those things. And, and, and turn against that that is coming your way, because it, in that particular passage of Scripture, uh, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he's talking about what we're fighting against. We don't fight against flesh and blood. We're fighting against principalities and powers of darkness and this and this uh, and, and, and the uh, darkness. And so we need to fight on that level. And so in our minds, we need to stop and say, you know, and that's why. It was so important for David to say, Your word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. Commitment of passage of scripture to memory. What is the biggest problem that you have that you're dealing with in your life? The biggest temptation that you deal with in your life that would cause you to be drawn away from Christ? I mean, I don't answer that. I want you to think about that in your mind. And I want you to go into, into, into the Bible and find passages of Scripture that relate to that and, and, and put that to memory. So that when that temptation comes up again, you start quoting the Bible verse. Start quoting Scripture. For it is written. For it is written. Do we have to give chapter and verse to No! <laughs> Jesus didn't do that. He says, hey, Satan, it's written, don't tempt the Lord your God. Chapter and verse is only for when we're trying to find it, but once it's in our mind, chapter and verse is not. So important. I would say, get thee behind me, Satan. Yeah, but why? Barbara, why? If I'm That's Satan and you're Barbara, why should I get behind you? Don't Barbara? make me get mad at my pastor. Get behind me, Satan. It is written. <laughs> Love your pastor. Where is it written? You said we didn't have to have chapter verse. <laughs> Pastor, what are things that I say? Here, here, here's the thing. I say? Let me say this. Here's the thing. If you're going to quote scripture, quote it right. Right. Okay? Get it right. One of the things that I say when I feel that Satan is buffeting me is one of my favorites. Satan, greater is he who is in exactly. me than, than you were in the world. Yeah. And that is such a simple and a profound scripture, and I believe it with all my heart, and it strengthens me, and it puts God's word in a very comforting way <coughs> in my mind. <coughs> and it works. And, and it works. works. Absolutely. Absolutely. God's word works. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you, the Bible says. Right. So stand firm. See, a lot of us, we cringe. We, and, and you know what? If, if you're out, in fact, I read, I don't know if you read the Daily Bread. I've read this the Daily Bread. You might know what I'm referring to. If you're, if you're out and you see this, this gigantic bear coming at you, big bear, right? you get scared, right? You kind of cry. But you know what? Compared to that bear, that devil's just like a little rat. A little mice, a little mouse. And, and, and we get afraid of little mice, but... Come on. Don't be afraid of the devil because, listen, just like you said, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And the fact is... You believe that with all your heart. Oh, yeah, you got to believe. You believe God's word, even if it doesn't make sense to the world. They say, how can it make sense so they don't believe it? 
but God's spirit tells us it's true. And so we don't doubt, no matter what. Well, they don't understand the word of God because they don't have the Holy Spirit in there to yes. interpret God's word and to explain God's word to them. Yes. That's why. Okay. Personally accountable for our thoughts. Secondly, we are personally accountable for our words. Matthew 12, 36, and 37. Matthew 12, 36, and 37. But I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Accountable by our words. Yeah, I was having a conversation. I can't remember who it was the other day. Uh, I mean, there were so many conversations during the week about different things like that. But I was talking about, you know what? Sometimes, and, 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 and tell me, and I've been guilty of this myself. I, I see somebody do something that is so totally ridiculous, and I say, you are so stupid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or you are an idiot. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. God, you messed up when you made that person. <laughs> you made them stupid. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just recently I came across and said something about, I'm paraphrasing, in the Bible, you will be condemned if you call someone a fool. Yeah, anyone that calls your brother rock a fool. That was you. That yeah. was you that told us recently. Yeah. Oh, oh my our, gosh. In our list. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay, that's where I saw it. So here's the thing, and, and Helen knows this. We could be driving around, somebody says something. I said, man, look at that idiot. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. God made him just like he made me. And God don't make no junk. Except like what some what some preacher once said, he says, but in your case, he came off a close. <laughs> <laughs> we had that conversation, remember, it was regarding the day when I mentioned that I told you that, you know, being at work at, on Fridays. Yeah. Here at the church, those are my days, and I usually find myself under a lot of attack, just a lot of stuff going on. And I, what, I was telling Jeff one day, I looked at him, because all this stuff coming at me. Hate Fridays. Not that I hate the church. I love coming here. This is my place of refuge. But then the Holy Spirit says, uh, no, 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 no. Today is the day that the Lord has made me glad and rejoice in. Right. Just, I felt so, yeah, you just had that feeling of, whoops. <laughs> I hate this day, but Lord, you made this day, so this day you must have messed up making this day because I really don't like it. Oh, that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, number three, uh, accountable for our attitudes. 2 Corinthians 5.10 uh, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Our attitude. So our attitude was bad the other day. Right? Yeah. Friday. It was. Yeah. <laughs> okay. do, do we all have bad attitudes once in a while? I think so. I'm also number four. Number four, we will be personally accountable for our actions. Psalm chapter 34, verse 13. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. That's that speaking it. Wouldn't that be words though? Uh, part of it, but your actions, you're actually acting it out, you're speaking it, you're you, you see your thoughts, that could also be thoughts because you think it in your mind and then you say it, right? I guess you could say your words are actions. Your words are actions. Yes, that is a... But, and does your sometimes words lead to other actions? That's why it says that, that we're to do away with anger and wrath and malice and, because one leads to the other. Some words stop further actions. Now, there's a fifth one, by the way. Uh, and it's this, our motives. What is our motive for that thought we had? What is our motive for that, that word we said, for that attitude that we had, for that action we took? Jeremiah, Jeremiah 17.10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. 
even to give every man according to his ways, according to his motives, according to the fruit of his doings. God searches the hearts of man to see what his motives are. What is your motive for doing this? We come to church on Sunday morning. What is my motive for coming to church? God knows why we come. Do we come just to the scene of others? Because uh, we want to look spiritual? You know, what is your motive? Is your motive that, that you go to that particular church because you're running for an office and you want the votes? And you want to look nice, look good before the public? What is your motive for giving? Is it because, you know, Jesus was really down with the Pharisees for that. They like to go around wearing these long robes so they get, you know, what is your motive for getting all dressed up looking nice? Is it because you want to put the best appearance you can to reflect Christ? Or is it because you want people to think that you're so well dressed and you're so good looking? What is your motive for, for doing this thing? The, the, the Pharisees stood out in the corners ringing bells and praying. Why? They, they used re repetition. And, and they gave, you know, ring the bell, put the money in there, see what I'm giving? What is my motive for that? And they had long, haggard-looking, scowling faces when they, well, they fasted. Well, they fasted, yeah. Sure what is my motive for that? They were fasting. Yeah. So, so our motives are going to be judged. And, and that's what God says. I search the heart to see what the motive is for why you're doing what you're doing. And you know what? You're going to get paid back according to what your motives are. So, okay, do, everyone have, do, do you all have your book? Not with me. In the car. All right. Okay. Uh, what what I'd like for you to do, this is your challenge for this week, is to go to the, the thing that says be reconciled. Okay. And look in there where it says examining my heart. Examining my heart. And uh, ask yourselves those questions that's in there. Have I taken full responsibility for my offenses? Is there anyone whom I have offended and have not asked to forgive me? Have I displayed pride in any way to the one whom I have offended? How have I served those whom I have offended? What gifts can I give to those whom I have offended? And that you don't give gifts to buy people off. I think if you read, read your lesson, you find out why. I'm in prayer for those chairs. <laughs> After asking for forgiveness, have I received release from the one I have offended? And do I examine my heart before worship? Now, here's the thing. And, and I think uh, Sharon brought this up. What happens if I go and, and try to make reconciliation, try to be reconciled with a brother, but they refuse to do that? And I have that situation in my life right now with another person. That, that I've tried to reconcile with, and they just totally... And it doesn't mean we were friends. It doesn't mean you have to be friends again. No. It just means that you have reconciled. Yeah. You're at peace so, with one another. Yeah, so here. Uh, well, when you do that, you have done your part. You have fulfilled your phalo, your duty, your responsibility to go and to seek reconciliation. You're, not, you're only responsible for your actions... For your thoughts, words, act, attitudes, actions, and motives. You're responsible for that, not theirs. So the best thing you can do is say, you know, I have done my best. The door is always open. And I'll leave it that way. But you pray for that person. And, uh, and you don't go around saying bad things about them. Okay? In AA, we say, keep your own side of the street clean. Yeah, your own side of the street, but yeah, very, very good. That's that makes sense to me. A good visual there, Fred. All right. Any questions, comments? Good lesson today. Yes. Yeah. Right. All right. Now, was the handouts? Was that, did that make it easier for you to? It's nice. Yes. Very nice.
Now I gotta do that every time? No, yeah. you don't have to. Uh, yes, you do. When you have time. When I have time, yeah. You know, that, I did that at uh, four, 5 o'clock this morning. Oh, wow. So, really? Yeah, you can make the time. Did you notice you gave us one of the answers? It was typed in when we fill in. It was already the answer. You forgot it was there. It was? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It is. I'm the first like, Let's see. It is the first page. Yeah. Number uh, six. Thank you. You're passing me. Number six, <laughs> believers. <laughs> yeah, it's over there. there. Uh -huh. okay. He didn't know that, did he? It was five minutes. Congratulations. You passed the test. <laughs> I caught it. They always say, give me, they give me blooper. Awesome. I'm good at finding hidden bloopers. Yeah. Oh, I'm right. I'm sorry. All right, let's close the prayer. Father, thank you uh, for this lesson today. And help us in our own hearts, Lord, to love one another and, uh, Father, to be reconciled with one another. That we, too, as the Apostle Paul had written, we will owe no one anything except the debt of love. May we pay that debt. And Lord, we owe you so much. And Father, help us to pay back that debt of love that you gave to us by loving others and, uh, and in that way, loving you. And I just pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.